Attorney, I think we're in need of a psychiatrist. <laughs> I figured out this case. <laughs> I have to give you a personal background of how come I'm intrigued by all this. It represents an historical circle for me. Some of you know that I am a psychiatrist that wound up meeting with three captured spies in jail for a year. I spent a lot of time working with them, uh, two hours a week for a full year, each of them, including Robert Hansen. And that led to my writing my white paper called Noir, N-O-I-R, to try to understand their psychology and what to do about it. After I started working with my first case, Earl Pitts, I realized that I simply didn't know enough about what goes on in the world of espionage. And whatever I could get my hands on, I had to find and read. Approximately a year after I started looking for these things, I found an old copy in a used bookstore of the book by Peter Wright, Spy Catcher. <clears throat> I didn't know anything about this world, but I figured, hey, the title is uh, calling to me, I will read it. And I did. And while I learned a lot about um, GHSQ uh, uh, in, in UK and UK uh, espionage matters, threaded through the whole book was this theme about this nasty person, Hollis, who had been the boss, who Peter Wright suspected of being a Soviet mole. It was just confusing to me, intriguing, mysterious, but I had many other things to do, so I just parked it in the back of my brain. Then came my next experience, which was with Robert Hansen, who turned out to be such a, a huge spy, right at the apex of knowledge within our intelligence community, so that he could give away enormous quantities of secrets. It didn't tickle that thing with Hollis right away. But then there was a, a, an offering from the spy museum to have a dinner with Dame Stella Remington. She was, in her turn, the head of MI5. How could I not do that? And I did. It cost me a few bucks, but I did it. And I sat right next to her for the dinner. And I couldn't wait to finally get my chance to bring up this Hollis story that was sitting in my brain for 15 years, unresolved, and as soon as I brought it up, you saw her demeanor turn from the engaging, charming person that she was to get very um, upset and angry. And she immediately launched into a very scathing portrayal of Peter Wright. What a, a screw-up he was, he was not good at all inside there, and on and on she went. And uh, I was taken aback, so I thought, oh, well, I mean, uh, there's a counter story to what I read in Peter Wright. It still didn't quite know what to make of it. And then uh, John uh, came to me to uh, propose that I serve on this panel and forced me to read the Pincher book, which is about this thick. John, you owe me. But I planned through it. And so it was my third iteration of uh, acquainting myself with the Hollis story. My job was to look at it from the point of view of, of a psychiatrist and address some of the early bits about him that do they possibly point to leading to a life of, of spying. Well, first of all, I must say that the material in the book was skimpy as to his early life. There was very little about his childhood. What you did hear is that he came from what I'm going to call a godly family. His father turned out to be a bishop and, and his older brother. 
And uh, Pincher makes a point of perhaps some sort of a rebellious attitude about, uh, and uh, uh, Pincher calls it a cloying attitude about living in a uh, uh, clergy type family. Well, I knew about that from some of my work because I had one of those as my patient one time, and he described his status to me as a PK. There's a, uh, I see some nods over here. That stands for preacher's kid, okay? And there's a thing that goes along with that, including a subset that will become rebels. So, okay, we maybe want to check off that box a little bit. And then the next outstanding thing in this history is him leaving um, Oxford before he graduated. Uh, there's a term that Pincher uses which is very British, I guess, is rusticated. I guess that's eased out, you know, in some fashion or the other. Well, uh, that I deal with in my office plenty. People who are full of promise, you would think, they come from a good family, and um, they have everything going for them, but somehow they just, it just slips and they, they, they leave. And I um, always see this as uh, leaving a mark of failure deep inside of a person. There's something missing, some emptiness, some sense of failure that they have to deal with in some fashion or the other. And of course in the, in the story of Hollis, he goes off to China to make his fortune. So, um, question, what, is, what to make out of all this? Well, in the work that I've done in my own paper, I make a point that all this could be collected under the heading of the sensitizing stage, stage one of the ten stages of the life of a spy. But I make a very strong point that for all of that, for all the things that you can collect about somebody who has uh, had adversity in their life, has had trouble, whatever, those things are not determinative. They may linger in the background, but it doesn't mean that, oh, for sure, this person could wind up and be a spy. No, 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 no. I don't believe that. Uh, and I don't believe in profiles for that reason either. I see things as evolving and unfolding over time, sort of like a movie, rather than a still photo that uh, captures, oh, this is your profile. Now, people ask me all the time about Snowden and Manning. You know, I've, I've worked with a conventional uh, class spies is what I call them, and I read about it, not worked with Snowden and, and Manning. But they asked me, well, how do I understand these kinds of people? And here's what I say. The psychology that I lay out, I think, is present in the early life of these uh, kids that mirrors and is similar to the conventional spies, which is to say, uh, the core psychology that people are left with is an intolerable sense of personal failure as privately defined by that person. So it's what's inside. You, as, typically, as a male figure, how are you going to manage and deal with a feeling of internal failure? But with Snowden and Manning, I couple that, I, I mash it up with another chunk of their psychology, which you all read about too, and that is what I call millennial psychology. You've heard that expression. And that's a bit unfair to millennials, but some of the more extremos would be the grandiosity and the narcissism, blah, blah, all of that stuff that's particular to this age and time. Now, using that as a concept for half a moment, let's get back to Hollis and say that, all right, the only thing that stands out is this dropping out of school and the clerical family, the godly family rebelling, yep, all right, but what else is going on? Well, the times were going on, not the millennial times, but this was the 30s, let's say. This was a post-World War I situation which was shocking and horrible to all the nations. Number two that is in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. You had a whole generation that was attracted to um, a romantic notion of a big idea to which they could attach themselves and become important and have significance and meaning for their lives. So was he 
uh, a part of that milieu? Sure he was. Did that uh, add up to something extra that may be understood that led to spy psychology? Possibly. But I'm going to throw in two last things and I'll quit. One, be careful about that sort of uh, jumping to conclusions. I was here when we had this memorial meeting for Brian Kelly, one of the professors of our IWP here. A dear friend of mine who was mistaken to be the spy that, of all things, the spy that I did work with, Robin Hansen, literally was. The FBI had, who knows, argument maps that laid out all the reasons why Brian Kelly was the one, but they were wrong. Okay? So anytime something like this comes up, there's a part of me that says, well, slow down, not sure yet, let's not jump to a conclusion, too much damage can happen. Okay, my second point comes from my unique knowledge, and that is I've broken the case. Yes, I have. I told you that he came from a godly family. Did I not? Yes, I did. Do we not know that those nasty Soviet spy masters had a sense of humor when they did certain things, like code names? Sure. What does Ellie mean in Hebrew? My God. <laughs> Oh, so they identified him as being from a godly family. Case closed! <laughs>